Throughout history, the church has been marked by difference makers. Nehemiah built the wall. David slayed Goliath. And Jesus changed the world. Brick by brick, the church has been built on the shoulders of hardworking people. The difference makers who are willing to get their hands dirty. Ready to do whatever it takes to reach people far from God and teach them how to follow Jesus step by step. Difference makers just like you. Difference makers. Here we are, new year, right? 2020. It's so good to be in a new year and know that uh, the tech problems follow you into the new year, right? <laughs> and it's not because of our tech people. They do a great job. They don't get paid enough, which is nothing. Uh, but here we are. If you, if you notice, though, when it was flashing on and off, if that happens, go ahead and, and kill it till the video at the end if we can. We just need the sound for that. But if you notice in between that, it was kind of like Morse code, right? And it was telling you to give more money. No. If you're a visitor here today, that's not true at all. We don't want your money. We want your hearts. God wants your hearts. So it's good to be here. What a year uh, we had and what a year we're going to have because we serve a mighty, mighty God. Got me thinking, though. Yesterday I had a lot of time on the road. I had the privilege of being able to go up to the Cathedral of College Basketball to Allen Fieldhouse to watch my Jayhawks play with my youngest daughter introduce her to this, this scene. And as I'm there and I'm walking through the museum and I'm taking in all the stuff and I've been there many times, but it's always fascinating to take in college basketball and to take in the tradition over a hundred years of college basketball at uh, the University of Kansas. A lot of great teams, a lot of great players, a lot of great coaches. But one of the things that I've noticed is that none of them ever stay very long, except for some of the coaches, but the players are always in and out. Maybe a year, maybe four if you're lucky. But it has been consistent with winning. Not because of one group of players. And it got me thinking about difference makers. And it got me thinking about over the last year, year and a half, this church has lost a lot of great people. A lot of saints who have put this church where it is today. They're reaping their rewards by being with Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that. But it got me thinking about, I can't under, I, I, it, doesn't, it, it amazes me that God is already ahead of us. And that we've landed on in 2020 this theme of being a difference maker. And as these great people, and if you haven't heard yesterday, Bill Robertson, and if you've never had the privilege to sit down with this man and to hear his incredible story of never giving up in life, no matter what life gave him, he passed away yesterday morning. And it got me thinking of all the other men and women who have gone before us already in the last year, and they have left a huge void in this church, and guess what? It's my time, your time to step up and to do something for the kingdom of God. One of my favorite movies is Remember the Titans and Herman Boone, which actually a couple of weeks ago passed on if you didn't hear it in the news. He's the head coach at T.C. Williams and they take this school and they take another school and, and they bring them together black and white in the same school and he's trying to hold this football team together with all the turmoil outside and they play a perfect season and they're in the state title. And they're down at halftime. And in the movie, and I'm sure it's probably not like it really happened. Because you know how Hollywood is, right? But it's great for the screen. He pulls them together on the sideline. And he says, it's our time. Our time. And they go on and to win the title and have a perfect season. It is our time, church our time to step up and to be a difference maker for the kingdom of God. I believe this morning, if you're here, whether 
you're a longtime member, or maybe you just stepped in for the first time this morning, we are glad that you are here. But I believe inside of every one of us, we are called to be difference makers. Not just to live our life, to have it easy, to have that flow that's casual, but to go out on a limb and to be a difference maker. So let me ask you this question. It's in your notes in your bulletin. If you got a bulletin this morning, there's an insert that has some notes that you can take. But I want to ask you this question. Who made a difference in your life? Who's that person that you're where you're at today because they invested in you? And it can't be your mom and dad, all right? That's, that's a gimme. All right, that should be. Now, I realize that some of you here this morning, and you didn't have a dad, you didn't have a father or a mother, maybe, maybe they walked away and they didn't invest in you, but it's a, it should be a given that your parents pour into you, all right? If my daughters were asked this question, who made a difference, and they said me, I would understand that. I think, okay, okay, but who else? I'm your dad. I love you, no matter how stupid you are at times. <laughs> right? Who is that person? Mine, mine is Dave Nice. I would love for him to be here to preach today's sermon, actually. He is, Dave Nice is a guy that I met when I was in the eighth grade. He, come, he came to Galesburg Christian Church right out of Bible College, right out of Ozark Bible College. Him and his wife, newly married, and they walk onto this scene, and Mr. Dave Nice was Mr. Everything. He was the senior minister. He was the youth minister. He was the children's minister. He was the worship leader. He was the church secretary. He did it all because our church was small. And he comes onto the scene, and I remember the first time I met him, he came to a junior high basketball game to watch me play. And then for the next five years, he followed my high school career. Was at every game. He was my youth minister. We made all kinds of trips to Worlds of Fun and to Silver Dollar City and to camps. I remember one of my favorite moments, though, is he would come to Tulsa to Mardell's to get supplies for the church, and he had convinced my parents to let me skip school to go with him. And being a farm boy, Tulsa was a pretty big time, right? Big town. And we came to the mall. We went to Mardell's. We had lunch at Casa Bonita. Yeah, yeah, they don't have those in Kansas, right? And they don't have them in Oklahoma anymore either. And I loved every minute of it. And he poured his life into me. And here's the thing that I noticed. He never, never pressured me into ministry. Never even once brought it up. So I graduate high school and I go to Ozark Christian College. And if you never knew this, I never intended to be in ministry. This is the last place I wanted to be. I went to Ozark to play basketball. And my goal was to play two years at Ozark, get my basics, and then go get a real degree. Right? Go to a real school. And all of a sudden, God began to do his thing with his difference maker. And my freshman year, during the summer, Dave went on vacation, and he had convinced me to preach a sermon. After one year at Ozark, I, I, to this day, I wish they would have recorded it because it, it had to be bad. <laughs> I would have loved to have heard it now, you know. And all of a sudden, he planted that seed. And then he started taking classes at Ozark, and he would room with me for a week. And he began to go, you know what, Lance? Maybe God is leading you in a different direction. And look at where I am today. You're sitting there this morning because somebody has made an investment in you. Somebody has been a difference maker in your life. Do you know who they are? Maybe the better question is this. Are you a difference maker? Are you pouring your life into somebody else for the kingdom of God? Right? Here's the thing that we want to do this morning real quickly. We want to look at, I believe, like I said earlier, that we are all difference makers. And what I want to do, though, is that in order for us to be a difference maker, we're going to have to do something, all right? In order for us to have company at our house, we tell our children they have to do what? Clean up the house, right? 
Your room's got to be clean. And if you've ever seen teenage girls' bathroom, it's one of the most disgusting things in this world. You got to clean up your bathroom, right? And so if we're going to be difference makers for the kingdom of God, we've got to make some changes. We've got to clean up our act. And so being a difference maker, we have to deal with our heart. When Adam and Eve sinned, we all came into this world with hard hearts. Instead of loving God and loving our neighbors, guess what happens? We love ourselves most of all. And that's true. None of us would admit that here this morning. But that really is true. Because let me ask you, how do you love your neighbors? And I'm not talking to people right beside you, down the street. How do you love your neighbors? When I was a senior at Ozark, my sister and I, she was older than me, we decided I would get out of the dorms and we rented a house together. It was not a great house, but we rented it together and I had the top floor, she had the bottom. And I remember there was this old house and it was run down, nobody lived in it, but there had to be like a hundred cats that lived in this building, this house. And every morning about seven o'clock, this woman would show up and she was quite intimidating. She could have took most men in this, this sanctuary this morning. She would get out of this truck, and I had a 7 o'clock class, so it didn't really matter. But my sister didn't. She worked. And she would drive up into the driveway of this house and get out at 7 o'clock in the morning and yell, Here, kitty, 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 as loud as she could. I was going to do it, but it would have made this place ring probably, right? And I, I mean, she would do this every morning. And finally, one morning I'm up and I'm getting ready, and I, I don't even know her name. All I know is she's scary looking. And she has a lot of cats. All of a sudden, though, she drives in and she yells, kitty, kitty, kitty. And my sister goes, Lance, will you take care of that? And so I open up my upstairs window and I yell out the window, hey, shut up, we're trying to sleep. Silence. I go downstairs and my sister meets me and she's like, what have you just done? Right? <laughs> I'm going to class. I don't know. you got to deal with the crazy woman with the cats, right? Isn't that how we deal with our neighbors, though? When I should have walked over and had a pleasant conversation with her? Maybe I should have took the time to get to know who she is. But no, I was more concerned about myself. And that's how we live our lives sometimes if we're really, truly honest with ourselves. Instead of worshiping God and honoring Him as Lord, we try to kick Him off the throne and take it for ourselves. And because of this heart issue that we have, guess what? We come into this world as God's enemies. It's not His fault, it's ours. We're the ones who have sinned. And so what does this have to do with being a difference maker, you might ask this morning? It has everything to do with a difference maker. Before you and I can be a difference maker, a difference must be made in us. We need healthy hearts. We need clean hearts. So if you've got your Bible this morning, turn to Isaiah. What I want to do this morning is I just want to give you a few principles so that because if you're sitting there this morning and you're looking at your life and you're going, you know what, I'm not, I'm not perfect, I'm not clean, I've made a lot of mistakes, I'm broken, it doesn't matter because we have a God who can correct that. And so I want to look at that. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to clean up our heart. We need to give it to God. And Isaiah is a great book. And if you have to break down the theme of Isaiah to one theme, it could be trust God. Isaiah is a difference maker in the highest degree. And Isaiah is writing to the people of Israel who have heart issues just like you and I do today. They trusted in everything and anything before they trusted in God. They trusted in their own kings, their own military. They failed. They tried to make alliances with other nations. If you read the book of Isaiah, you see this. And, and they, they tried to put their trust in these alliances as their kings and their military. And guess what happened? It failed. They trusted in their external religion to keep God off their backs. But all the while, Isaiah is speaking to their hearts and trying to help them understand that their greatest need 
And our greatest need is to trust God. So if you have your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 2. It's in your notes or if you want to look at the screen. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. I don't know about you, but that's a common theme that we seem like to be hitting on these last several months. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Verse 4, and oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who have dealt, dealed corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. How sad is that? What is, what is Isaiah saying here? They don't know who God is. They have wandered away from Him. What you're looking at here is not a God who has every right to be mad, right? When you stop and you look at what Isaiah is saying... And God, you hear God's voice talking about how they've wandered away, they've rebelled, they've pushed back against God, and God has every right to be mad, but he doesn't. Ever been there before? I remember in my first ministry, we had bought, the church bought a parsonage. They don't do that anymore, all right, but... I had a house. I mean, I was right out of Bible college. didn't have the money to buy one. And they buy a nice house. It was a nice little two, three-bedroom house. And it had a basement. It wasn't finished. And what the the elders had decided, and I was still single. I was dating Carrie. We weren't married yet. And so I had all the free time in the world, according to our elders. They put in our basement like a game room for the whole community, for all the kids to come over. We had an air hockey table. We had ping pong. We had, they, they put a deep freeze down there, and they, they stocked it with frozen pizzas so that I could pull them out and nuke them or put them in the oven, and kids would just have a party. And they did. They came. It was crazy. I remember, though, we had a Super Bowl party, and we have all this incredible, nice stuff that the church has poured into and the kids come over and wreck everything i go down after the party and we have this nice air hockey table and carrie can remember this somebody had lost a game they had some anger management problems obviously and they had taken the air hockey table uh, the puck the thing the paddle and had banged it and it i mean there was like three or four big old holes brand new I come down, all the kids are gone, and I see this, and immediately, I'm like, oh my goodness. We go back Wednesday night, this is Sunday night, the Super Bowl, Wednesday night comes, I burst into the youth room at the church, and all of God's wrath followed me, right? I was upset. I unloaded. And God has every right right here in Isaiah to do this, but he doesn't, does he? He does not do that. That's not what he's talking about here. Instead, God is reminding the Israelites of his kindness, of his faithfulness to them. He gave them everything. He freed them from slavery in Egypt. He made them a nation. He brought them into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and Dr. Pepper. (laughs) Honey, all right. A guy can dream, right? He gave them prosperity. But what did they do? They rebelled against God. They chose not to know him or honor him as their father. They disobeyed his law and worshiped false gods. They turned their backs and listened to what the difference maker says. Because in order for us to have a clean heart, in order for us to be a difference maker, listen to what the great difference maker Isaiah says to them. And this is actually the first thing he tells the Israelites here. And it's verse 16, and it's beautiful. And he simply tells them, stop sinning. Stop sinning. Verse 16, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Stop sinning. Here's what I'm going to place a bet on today. 
that 90% of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, I bet you know when you're sinning. Right? You can feel it. That anger when, you're, when your kid does something they're not supposed to do. Right? Or you know that gossip that you just got to tell somebody about and you know before you even say it that it's gossip but you still do it anyway. Or, or when you cheat, you know you're cheating. You know, and Isaiah says, stop sinning. Stop sinning. You know what the problem is, and the, it's always the problem. It's sin. Either love hinders sin in our lives or sin hinders love. And God is serious about two things this morning, guys. I wanted you to understand this. We serve a God who is serious about sin, and he's serious about love. Many of us want God to be serious about love and not serious about sin. And we have this misconception that God is more into love than he is into sin, because God is a God of love, and he's just going to be, his love is so much bigger than sin, and, and he's not going to do anything about my sin. But the te- Bible tells us he is serious about both. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, if you want to look at it, it actually says that God is holy, holy, holy. Now, when the Old Testament writers wrote the Old Testament, they didn't have the privilege of choked on my... Got my gum choked on. (laughs) It's still stuck there, man. Yeah, hey, let's play a video. All right, there it goes. Where's TJ? You almost had to come do the Heimlich. All right, God, what are you trying to tell me? Right? So in Isaiah 6, 3, it says, holy, holy, holy. And so the Old Testament writers, when they were writing it, they didn't have the luxury that we have where they could use italics, 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 all right, whatever, bold, all right, or caps. This is way off mark now, right? We're, we're freelancing it, all right? Man, you really, I'm really starting to go. Is 2020 really going to go like this? That yeah, must be, man. Maybe my first sermon was better than this one, right? So when they're writing this, And the writers use the word three times, and they're repeating it to make an emphasis. All right, they couldn't put bold letters. They didn't have all caps. They wanted to make a point that God is serious about this, that he is serious about his holiness. Holy, holy, holy. Nowhere else in the Bible where you'll see God is love, 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 right? Nowhere else will you see that God is faithful, faithful, faithful. God is mercy, mercy. He's all those things, but it's never repeated Because God is holy, holy, holy. That's his big thing. And everything out of everything that comes out of him comes from his completeness of being holy. By being holy. And we get to see that. Theologian Mildred Erickson puts it this way. These are two basic aspects to God's holiness. The first is his uniqueness. He is totally set apart. The other aspect of God's holiness is his absolute purity of goodness. That means that he is untouched and unstained by evil. And so here's the key to understanding this holy, holy, holy. All of God's characteristics flow from his perfect holiness. Greg Matton says this, in God's total otherness and his complete purity and perfection, he exercises all of his other characteristics, his acts and his wrath and his justice towards sin. He shows mercy and compassion. He loves, and he does all of these things perfectly in his complete holiness. And so when we say that God is serious about sin and God is serious about love, he can be serious about both items because he is complete. And if God is serious about sin, guess what, people? We need to be serious about sin. 
That is why God can be serious about love and serious about sin. John Owen, the great Puritan pastor, used to say this, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And I wonder how often, church, we overlook our sin. We make excuses, we justify it, we kick it to the curb because that's who I am. That's my personality. I want God to deal with my sin. I know it's going to be painful. I know it's not going to be pleasant. But guess what happens when he deals with it? He makes me complete. He makes me holy. Listen to what Isaiah goes on to say. In verse 17. So if we're going to clean our heart up and give it to God, we've got to stop sinning. But now we have to start doing good. In verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct opposition or oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's case. And I feel like as a church, as a whole, we are doing that to some degree. But I often wonder, as a leader, could we do it better and more often? Now when you hear Isaiah and you're looking at this, and so you're looking at it, hey, I need to clean up my heart. I need to give it to God so he can clean it and make it pure again. I need to stop sinning, and I need to start doing good. All of a sudden, this, this, and maybe you won't admit this. Maybe I wouldn't admit it either. But we look at it, and we stop, and we start to think to ourselves, you know what? I know what we got to do now. Thanks a lot, Lance. Got to come to church more often. Got to check all those boxes, Right? we got to start doing more stuff, being here longer and doing more ministry. I get it. So that I can get God off my back and guess, guess what, people? That's not what God is asking you to do. It's not what he's asking you to do at all. Isaiah is not getting at that. What Isaiah is saying that if we really love God, it will be evident in the way we love our neighbors. And that is what is listed here in verse 17. It's a God-centered heart. Let me ask you, where's your heart? What would you be willing to do? Isaiah has laid it down to us. We begin to examine our heart, and the first thing that we need to do is stop sinning, but now we need to start doing good. And I love how Jesus calls his first disciples. You ever notice that? I love how he comes along with the disciples and he doesn't just, uh, he, he invites them into a relationship. Have you ever noticed that? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4. I just want you to see this because Jesus is a difference maker and that is what our lives should be about. And Isaiah has laid it out stop sinning, start doing good. Jesus comes onto the scene, he calls these 12 men. He's right, he didn't just make them and, and have a six-week course and then send them out into the world, did he? No, instead, he invests in them. He builds a relationship with them. He invites them into a relationship with him. And in Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 18, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he, see, and he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. And they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen and he said to them follow me and I will make you fishers of men in verse 20 they immediately left their nets and they followed him have you ever been fishing it's amazing the similarities between fishing for fish and fishing for men but you can't learn it overnight it takes time to be really good at catching fish right I have a buddy in Texas who decided that he was going to be a professional fisherman. He's not quite there. He's been training and learning and trying to get all the knowledge. He's two years into it. And he, and he wrote on his Facebook page, I never realized how difficult it was. This is why Jesus invested in these men. He brought them into a relationship. He was going to change their lives to be difference makers. But it wasn't a quick fix. He took his time. Jesus invites us into a relationship with him so that he can change our heart so that we can stop sinning 
so we can start doing good. Inside the bulletin, in that insert that you have, there is three questions at the bottom of that. They're up on the screen. I th- no, they're not. All right? So you'll have to look at the insert. There's three questions that are there. And the question is, what is something that you believe can you, that you can accomplish or improve upon? In the year 2020, what is something that you can do or improve on? Let me give you an example of what this might look like. I can overcome my addictions. We can feed a struggling family. And when I say we, it might be your family. It might be your circle of friends. All right? Or it might be the church. As you, as you have a vision. And then the last one. What can God, God can blank. God can heal our wounded family. Now as you look at that and you think about that. Let me ask you this question. Which one of these is the most difficult for you to believe in? Which one? I can, we can, or God can? Because let me tell you, God can, through you, do anything. That if you stop sinning, and start doing good and letting him change your heart and you get into a relationship with Jesus, everything changes. God can even take a teenage boy. Do we have that video? Can we play it? Gabe, tell me what kingdom work is in your life right now. So when I was eight years old, um, we used to, my family used to go to this co-op on Fridays and um, at the end of the day, on the first day of the classes, um, I looked at my schedule and I saw that I had a cake decorating class. And um, I was kind of mad at my mom because I didn't know I was taking that class. (laughs) And um, she had signed me up to that class without me knowing. And when I walked in, I was the youngest and only boy. Um, So (laughs) after about two or three weeks, I decided that this might be something that I want to pursue. In over four years, I excelled through all four courses. During that time, I entered into the little cake decorating contest at that co-op, and I won first place, and so I decided to enter the state fair for Kentucky, and I won first place in my division as well. So I was really praying about how God could use something as simple as cake um, to further his kingdom. Um, I finished the classes when I was 12, so when I was 13, a year after that, um, we got a Samaritan's Purse catalog in the mail. Um, So we looked through the catalog and we really wanted to do something to help um, because these people have nothing. They are dying of diseases that we can cure with a shot or a vaccine. We decided to raise money for chickens for $14. Our neighborhood garage sale was coming up. We decided to make cupcakes for that and sell them and we actually raised $35 and so we saved that money and went for something a little bit bigger like a goat for $70 and so we asked my cousins if they would donate and by the end of the week we had the $70 and so we decided to save it again and go for medical supplies for $150 and um, I had a Facebook page before that um, to show people my cakes and things like that and that was called Gabe the Cake Man. So I had posted <laughs> <laughs> So I had posted on there that if anyone would donate, I would make them a cake. And, um, but we realized that the $150 was something that we could do alone. Um, it really did not take any faith at all. Um, so we, we, my sister and I prayed about it, and we really wanted to do something that when people looked back on it, they would have to say, that was God, that was not those two children. And we looked through the catalog and decided on a hospital which was $35,000. So we began raising that money. And after we had posted on our Facebook page, within an hour, um, people started to order cakes and donate and things like that. And within 11 and a half months, we raised the $35,000 by speaking and making cakes and having people um, help us in many different ways. And um, Samaritan's Purse decided to take us to Africa 
to see the hospital built. And that was really cool. We got to uh, be a part of the dedication service. And when we went there, the people just kept on coming up to us and thanking us because before their country is so full of destruction in their history that they had thought that God had forgotten them and they really didn't have any hope. And so seeing that two children from another side of the world um, saw their needs and wanted to do something for them, um, it just showed them that God had never forgotten about them. He had something bigger in the works. And we really wanted people to realize that kingdom work is not always about raising money. It's just about using your gift or talent and seeing where God leads you with that. My name is Gabe and I'm a kingdom worker. Yeah, crazy, right? I saw that video in 2016 in Michigan. Those seniors that are here today were freshmen. And when I saw that video, I was amazed. I was blown away. $35,000 raised in less than a year by two teenagers using their talents and gifts to be difference makers. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying here, don't give, don't, don't, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not asking, and I don't think God is asking for any of you to go out and raise 35000 to build a hospital. Maybe he is. That's between you and God. What I noticed, though, in Gabe is that he started out small, and he realized that even at this small, I could accomplish that on my own. I wanted to do something that when we look back on it, go, that was not me. That was God. My encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, this morning is that you serve a tremendously big God that can take baking cakes and build in a hospital. Only he can do that. What he's asking for you and I is to get out of the boat, to not sit on the sideline, but to step in to him and let him use your life, your gifts, your talents to be a difference maker. And this is my prayer, and I hope you will adopt it too. For 2020, Greg Maddock writes this, and I'm going to steal it because it's so good. I was made for more than watching. I have history-changing, difference-making, life-giving, spirit-empowered legacy to leave. And Jesus, I ask you to work deeply in me, clearly through me as I pray, as I give, as I go in your love. I am, you are, we are a difference maker in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and worship.